little late. So, if we begin, if we've begun, uh, what we're going to do today is I'll finish up the story briefly on DNA. Last time we'd gotten to the point of talking about DNA polymerase and describing how there was a template strand and then a new strand, and how the template strand was the, the strand that was being read by the DNA polymerase, and the new strand was then the complement to that template strand. And we made a big deal toward the end there that there's a leading strand and a lagging strand, and the leading strand derives from the idea that the DNA polymerase reads consistently without interruption along that leading strand. But the caveat is the, uh, the DNA polymerase always, always, always has to read 3' prime to 5' prime and generate the complementary strand 5' prime to 3'. Prime. Because of the antiparallel organization of the two strands in every DNA molecule, each time the DNA molecule is replicated, that means that another DNA polymerase has to attach to the template strand on the other side, the complementary strand of DNA, and read 3' prime to 5'. Prime. This gives rise to the so-called Okazaki fragments, because it means that the DNA polymerase is reading in fits and starts along that 3' prime to 5' prime region in the complementary strand. So with that then, we're going to move on and talk about a very close cousin to the nucleic acid DNA. And this close cousin, of course, is ribonucleic acid. And ribonucleic acid, again, is built on a five-carbon sugar called ribose. And again, the five-carbon sugar, as we saw yesterday with deoxyribose, the five-carbon sugar ribose will have bases attached to the number one carbon. And these bases are remarkably similar. There are the two purines, adenine and guanine. And there are the two pyrimidines, cytosine, which was the same as we saw yesterday in DNA, and then uracil. But uracil is just a modification, or thymine is really just a modification of uracil. Thymine being 5-methyluracil. So this is, these structures, the pyrimidines and purines, are really reminiscent of what we talked about yesterday with DNA. But one of the major differences between DNA and RNA is we emphasized yesterday that DNA is always thrown into that double helix. The strands are always curved one around the other by the, I'm sorry, curved one around the other because of the hydrophobic nature of the bases, and it forces the molecule into the helix. That helix is permitted to a large extent by the lack of the hydroxyl group on the number two carbon of ribose. So now what we'll see is that the number two carbon of ribose has a hydroxyl group on it. That's a big bulky group. And one of the upshots of that is that RNA does not form that double helix. It forms a single strand. Now the single strand then is not regularly thrown into a helical shape, but instead will fold back on itself and through base pairing within the molecule begin to form a rudimentary three-dimensional shape. The rudimentary three-dimensional shape becomes important because it now provides a certain level of enzymatic activity to these ribose molecules. And we're going to see as we walk our way through this that even in modern biology, the ribose, the ribose molecules, particularly the one in ribosomal RNA, the RNA in ribosomes, those RNA molecules now, because of their three-dimensional shape, will have a certain enzymatic activity. In the case of the ribosome, it's to form a peptide bond. If We won't mention it much in here, but there are all manner of regulatory RNAs. And these regulatory RNAs, many of these maintain a certain level of enzymatic activity. And this probably dates all the way back to the early days of biology in the planet, before we had DNA-based biology and protein-based biology. It looks like biology started as an RNA system. And some of these enzymatic activities, the so-called ribozymes of RNA, date back to those times. We still have some of these rudiments in our cells, and they play really important roles. But then what I want to think about is where yesterday's emphasis was on the idea of DNA replication and was involved only when cells were dividing. The only time you need to replicate DNA is when you want to make new copies for new cells. So cell division requires DNA replication, but that's a fairly rare event. 
In the life of some cells, it happens every few days, but in the life of other cells like neurons, it happens only during embryonic development. So replication, cell replication is a fairly rare event. And the structure of the DNA imparts a certain amount of stability to that molecule. But what we're going to talk about now is how we can go from a DNA structure to an RNA structure. This is going to be called RNA transcription. Another way of phrasing this is to say that the DNA, as we've said several times in here, provides a kind of warehouse of information. And then what we'll do is we're going to use RNA tr transcription to convert the information in the base sequence in DNA into a base sequence in RNA. But if you think about this for a moment, it, it turns to, out to be rather problematic because we could imagine yesterday in replicating the DNA starting at one end of the molecule and running from one end of the molecule all the way to the other throughout an entire chromosome. You could imagine then that chromosome may have several, several hundred genes on it. And so we would just go reading straight through it and replicate it. But now we have the additional problem. Because what we're going to do is we have to figure out a way to take this sequence of letters, a sequence of fundamentally tens of millions of letters, and decide where within that, that, that word salad of all these letters, how do we manage to start this? How do we say, there's a gene. We're only going to read a certain short region of the DNA to transcribe that into RNA. We're going to call that short region a gene. How do we find that gene in this enormously long list of letters? Well, the answer to that is we find the beginning point of a gene through a consensus sequence of bases in the DNA. The sequence, the, there are several of these. There are several sequen, base sequences that are, are commonly recognized as so-called promoters. Another way of saying that is that the promoter is a base sequence in DNA to which transcription factors bind. So what we're going to see is that this continuous set of letters now will have subregions called promoters. And those subregions called promoters are sites to which we can bind other proteins called transcription factors. And that's a, a signal to say, begin here. So the promoter is in the DNA. The transcription factor is usually about oh, 13 to 15 proteins that will bind to the promoter. The most common of the promoters is something known as a Tata box, but there are several of them. But the one we commonly refer to is thymine, adenine, thymine, adenine, and usually there are two more adenines out here. But that's known as a Tata box. That's a promoter. These are bases in the DNA which say this is the beginning of a gene. That's the site to which transcription factors bind. And then about, oh, 25, maybe 35 to 50 bases downstream of that site toward the five prime end, then that will be the transcription start site. That's where we're going to start actually transcribing the, the DNA into RNA. To transcribe the DNA into RNA requires an enzyme that is going to remind us a whole lot of the DNA polymerase yesterday. This is an RNA polymerase. The RNA polymerase will bind to the transcription factors. Now again, the transcription factors are bound to the Tata box, which is the promoter. They then say, we're going to start reading a gene here. The reading of the gene is done by the RNA polymerase. And what it does is it will recognize the sense strand of the DNA. We're going to use only one strand. It will recognize the sense strand, and now begin walking along that sense strand, putting in the complementary bases. And we'll walk our way through that, but I think you can see from what we talked about yesterday that when we generate that new molecule of RNA by an RNA polymerase, we need to have the complementary bases. So when the RNA polymerase sees a cytosine in the DNA, it will put in a guanine. When it sees a guanine, it will put in a cytosine. When it sees a thymine, it will put in an adenine. But when it sees an adenine in the DNA, it will put in a uracil. But the uracil is just a fancy sort of slightly modified thymine. So the complementarity of bases, purines to pyrimidines, will hold also as we generate this molecule of RNA. So we'll march along 
the template strand of the DNA, putting in the right bases one at a time until we come to an end of the gene that says that's the end of the gene and stop here. The end is not fairly, not completely understood yet. We don't know exactly how these RNA polymerases say that's the end of the gene and transcription stops. But what we've done then is we have used the RNA polymerase to read the DNA molecule in the three prime to five prime direction, just like we saw yesterday for DNA polymerase. Just as we saw yesterday for DNA polymerase, the complementary strand is now going to be five prime to three prime. So again, when we use these polymerases, we read three to five, but we generate in the opposite direction, five to three. Now, if we were discussing prokaryotic biology, we would find that for every base in the DNA, there was a complementary base in the RNA. And, they, and then that RNA would then be translated into protein, and we could trace back each of those bases to the appropriate amino acid in the protein. But eukaryotes have figured out a whole new trick. Eukaryotes do this clever thing of RNA editing. So it all starts the same as we saw in prokaryotes. And what I mean by that is the DNA provides a template. The RNA polymerase walks along the DNA strand and generates a new RNA molecule. But that RNA molecule now is processed. In the nucleus, there are special enzymes that process the, what we call, pre-mRNA molecule. What these enzymes do is they cut out certain segments of the RNA and throw them away. This is called the introns. And then they splice these ends back together again, and they'll leave in place regions of the RNA that will be translated into protein. Those regions that are translated or expressed into protein are called exons. So again, exons are expressed regions. These are base sequences that are destined to be, to be read by ribosomes and convert into, pro, into an amino acid sequence, whereas the introns are the regions that are cut out and just discarded. They're cut back to their basic bases, and, and those bases are recycled. So we don't do anything with the introns. The exons are the most important part. Now, as we walk our way through this, we're going to tell the story for the most part from the point of view of the mRNA. It's one of the things I have to do down here is I have to add the section of types of RNA. And we're mostly going to talk about messenger RNA. But it's important to know that there are also transfer RNAs, and we'll talk about these, and ribosomal RNAs, and regulatory RNAs. Most of our time is going to be spent on the mRNA because it's the mRNA that's carrying the information about the amino acid sequence. So we're going to directly talk about the amino acid sequence based on the sequence of, of bases in the, in the RNA transcript, the edited RNA transcript. Transfer RNAs are going to be used exclusively to carry amino acids to the ribosome, which is mostly ribosomal RNA. And all three of these will work in concert now to make protein. And we'll talk in some detail about that. And then the regulatory RNAs, we're going to sort of skate right over. If you take a cell biology course, you're going to learn a whole lot about regulatory RNAs. They're really, really important. They regulate all manner of things in the nucleus and also in the cytoplasm. And uh, we'll touch on a couple of them, but not very many. But let's begin here by talking about the structure of ribonucleic acid. This, of course, is RNA. And again, the basic structure here is one that's familiar from yesterday. This is a 5-carbon sugar. Now, yesterday we emphasized that at a number 2 carbon, there were two hydrogens bonded covalently. But this is different in ribose. The number two carbon has attached a hydroxyl. 
this is a pretty bulky group, so it actually gets in the way of forming a helix from ribose, or from and and and, um, and ribonucleic acid. But the other ideas also pertain. Out here on the number one carbon as a base. Could be adenine, it could be cytosine, guanine, or it could be uracil. So the bases are adenine and guanine. These, of course, are the purines. And cytosine and uracil, which are the pyrimidines. So any of those four bases can be covalently attached by their nitrogens to the glycosidic bond at the number one carbon. And just as we saw yesterday, this carbon up here, the number five carbon, if we just had ribose, would now have a hydroxyl on this. But more commonly, what we see, particularly when we're going to generate a polymer of these molecules, is this is going to come in as a carbon, phosphorus, oxygen, phosphorus. I'm sorry, there should be oxygen here. Now, I won't go through all the tails, but this is this, the, the same structure that we saw yesterday. Yes? Okay, so it's a great question. What I've, this is about the number three carbon. And the question that was asked is, this, does the number three carbon have a hydroxyl on it? And it certainly does. And as we saw yesterday, we're going to use this number three carbon's hydroxyl to form a phosphodiester linkage. So we can take another ribose here with whatever base is attached. It's hydroxyl at the number two. It's hydroxyl at the number three. The number five carbon in O, P, O, P, O, P, O, H. And again, we'll take this oxygen, this phosphorus, and this oxygen and generate the oxygen-phosphorus-oxygen bond. So again, this is a phospho diester bond. So just as we saw in DNA, where these side chains of sugars are all linked covalently one to the next through phosphodiester bonds, we now can make this great long chain of these ribose molecules all linked by their phosphodiester bonds. Yes? They, this is the triphosphate. Okay. So this is O, P, O, P. O, H. O, there, there are three phosphates with a hydroxyl out here. Each of these phosphates will have a double bonded oxygen and an O negative. So this is absolutely the same as we saw yesterday with DNA. Okay. The only distinction here is rather than attaching the triphosphate to the number five carbon on deoxyribose, which we talked about yesterday, we're now attaching it to a ribose. Okay, cool. Thank you. And the only distinction, again, is the hydroxyl down here. And just as before, just as we saw in DNA, we'll use the energy of the triphosphate in, in conjunction with the enzyme we'll see a little later today, the RNA polymerase, to form these phosphodiester bonds. We can make great long strings of these. Now, yesterday's discussion emphasized the point that when we made a DNA molecule, when we replicated a DNA molecule, we used the two strands in DNA and again reestablished the double helix. This molecule does not fold into a helix very well. It doesn't fold into a helix largely because of the steric hindrance of these hydroxyl groups. So what happens in these molecules, though, is that they will fold back on themselves. And so I'll try to make this fairly, this little simpler by using the same nomenclature we had last time, where this is meant to be the phosphodiester linkages. And then these are the bases 
And this could be adenine and uracil and guanine and cytosine and cytosine and guanine. Now, remember, these are relatively hydrophobic molecules. And so they would like to be able to hide away from the water. And so what will happen is that we'll see that RNA molecules have this capacity to loop around. And there'll be short stretches where this adenine will bind to your uracil, your uracil to an adenine, this guanine to a cytosine, guanine, guanine, and cytosine. This is simply saying that because the molecule is restricted and cannot form the double helix, it can still fold back on itself. So if this is the three prime end, and this is the five prime end, it can fold back on itself and through base pairing. And by folding in different ways, it can now begin to generate a three-dimensional structure. It's really important that the idea that we can get a rudimentary a rudimentary 3D structure by RNA folding can yield rudimentary enzymatic activity. Now, the breadth of enzymatic activity we can generate from these molecules is nothing compared to what we can generate from proteins. After all, we have 20 different amino acids in proteins, so we can fold those, and we have all those exquisitely complicated R groups, so we can fold protein molecules and remarkably complex three-dimensional structures. We're kind of limited here with these four bases. We just don't have as many degrees of freedom. But nonetheless, we can get a certain amount of folding here to get a certain amount of three-dimensional structure to Im impart to these molecules a level of enzymatic activity. As life developed on the planet, we think it all began this way. We think the early forms of life used RNA as a kind of enzyme, and, and rather than before we knew how to make proteins, we made RNAs. And then it, so, in some thoughts about this, then once we had generated RNA life, DNA followed from that, and then from there we could make proteins. But early on, we were using RNA as a kind of three-dimensional structure to generate enzymatic activity. And those enzymatic activities, if you get down into the weeds of cell biology, you'll find that there are many of these enzymatic activities that are retained in modern eukaryotic organisms. And in fact, one of the ones we'll find, and one I'll emphasize here, is that ribosomal RNA contains base sequences that enzymatically, let me do it this way, that serve as enzymes to form peptide bonds. More on that later. But the point here is simply that even though the RNA molecule is a string shown here from the five prime to the three prime end, even though it's a continuous string of these ribose molecules linked by phosphodiester bonds and connected to bases, because of the ability of the molecule to fold back on itself, it can generate a certain three-dimensional shape. And that certain three-dimensional shape has implications for enzymatic activity. But it still leaves open the question of how do we make RNA? 
how RNA is synthesized from a DNA template. Well, the first idea I want to introduce here is a kind of complication. And that is that you know that you have 46 chromosomes, but they come as 23 pairs. So that means you have 23 chromosomes that can generate roughly 20,000 different proteins. So in other words, another way of phrasing that is there are about 20,000 genes in the genome. Those 20,000 genes are divided more or less, equally among the 23 chromosomes. That's a long-winded way of saying that each one of the chromosomes contains several hundred genes. And each of those chromosomes, as we saw yesterday, when you look at it, appears to be nothing more than this string of the four bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. So there's a string of bases from one end to the next. And how do you decide in that great long string of maybe 10 million or more bases that there's a site that says, this is the beginning of a gene. This is the beginning of one of the genes on this chromosome, one of several hundred genes on the chromosome. How do you know where that is? And so the question we want to address here is how does, oops, how does the enzyme RNA polymerase know where to start? Reading the DNA template strand. And I'll try to illustrate this by imagining here we have a DNA strand. I won't put in the complement. I'm just going to show this as a DNA strand. Again, using the blue line to represent the phosphodiester linkages between adjacent deoxyriboses. And then each of those deoxyriboses having covalently attached at the number one carbon these bases. And I'm only going to put oh, a few of them in here, but remember that this is a full chromosome. There may be tens of millions of these. And so if we now say this is a thymine, this is a guanine, a cytosine, a cytosine, a guanine, thymine, adenine, thymine, adenine, thymine, adenine, usually an adenine and adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, adenine, <clears throat> guanine, cytosine. Now, this looks like just a string of letters. And where do you decide in this string of letters that we're going to start a gene. Where is the start site for a gene? And we can think of the start site for a gene to be something known as a Tata box. The Tata box is thymine, adenine, thymine, adenine. Usually it's thymine, adenine, thymine, adenine, adenine, adenine. There's some wiggle in this sometimes, but they're, they're, they're always purines. I'm sorry, there's some wiggle in this, but they could either be thymines or they could be adenines. But be that as it may, we think of this as the so-called Tata box. Now, If we simply walk through this the way I drew it out, here's T, G, C, C, G, T, A, T, A, T, A. There's the Tata box. It's buried in here. 
But this Tata box is said to be a promoter. And the definition of a promoter is a consensus sequence of bases in DNA where proteins called transcription factors bind. Now, if you get into the subbiologist, you're going to find subbiology of all of this. You're going to find that these transcription factors are aggregations of many proteins, usually 13 to 15. I'm simply going to say that what will happen is we'll find a region in the DNA to which this molecule of protein known as a transcription factor. I mean, this bevy of proteins called a transcription factor. Binds. So again, we have the Tata box. It's a sequence of bases within the DNA. We're going to arrange this DNA such that this is the three prime end, and this is the five prime end. The transcription factors have sought out and bound to the Tata box. The binding of the transcription factors to the Tata box now recruits another protein. Put it in blue. It recruits another protein here. I'm just going to show it as a box. And this protein is an RNA polymerase. So the RNA polymerase does not know where to bind along this great stretch of basis in the DNA. It requires the initial binding of the transcription factor, the Tata box, which then signals that as a site to which the RNA polymerase can bind. Yes? So do they always start at the adenine? So typically, the promoter is the Tata box. If you get down into this, there's several different there are several different promoters. This is the most common. I think something like 80% of all the promoters of the Tata box. And they always bind at this four or five base region. It probably covers more of the DNA than what I'm showing here because it's a sizable protein complex. And we're down here at molecular dimensions with these individual bases. So it's covering over a considerable amount more. And then when the RNA polymerase binds, and maybe this will help answer your question, we don't start right at the next one. In fact, it normally starts, the, the, the start site for transcription is usually something like, oh, 25 to 35 bases toward the five prime end. But that's a detail. What I want to emphasize is that the RNA polymerase now is going to be the enzyme that is going to walk along the DNA molecule. And as it walks along the DNA molecule, I'm going to cheat a little bit and start here so I don't have to draw in another 30 bases. And say that the RNA polymerase is now going to find the complement to the thymine. So it will then, put this in orange, it will then put in an adenine. The adenine, of course, will be linked covalently. Getting red. It will be linked covalent to the number one carbon on the ribose. And then the polymerase now will form the phosphodiester bond between this adenine and the complement to this adenine, which is going to be uracil, because we don't have thymine in RNA. So instead, the RNA polymerase says, all right, a uracil base pairs here. I form the phosphodiester linkage. I walk down to the next base, which is now going to be an orange, a cytosine. 
and then a guanine, and form the appropriate phosphodiester linkages. So what's happening here is, in fact, the RNA polymerase doesn't require a helicase. The RNA polymerase on its own will unwind the DNA molecule and walk along the template strand. But the story that we see here is akin to the story we saw yesterday, where we're using DNA polymerase to find the appropriate base and form the phosphodiester bonds. Now we're using RNA polymerase. And we walk along the DNA molecule in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction, generating the RNA molecule from the 5' prime to the 3' prime direction. And this, I won't belabor it too much, but then each time it finds a base in the DNA of, say, thymine, adenine, cytosine, guanine, it puts in the appropriate complementary base. So now we're beginning to see that we're generating a string of bases We're generating a string of bases that are complementary to the DNA strand. And from what we talked about yesterday, it's the same pattern. It's just we're making RNA rather than DNA, and we're using an RNA polymerase rather than a DNA polymerase. And because we have so many genes in each individual chromosome, we need a start point. And that start point is generally the promoter, the Tata box. Again, if you take a cell biology course, you're going to find there are other regulators upstream of this, but we're not going to get into those. Yes? So, since DNA is one stranded, um, RNA is one stranded, um, when the RNA polymerase binds to the DNA and starts it as a separate strand, how does it know which side of the DNA to have it as a separate strand? If it was on the other side, wouldn't the sequence be different? So, the question here is, how does it know how does it know the strand to bind to and although i've shown you the tata box there are probably extensions beyond that that are important for the binding of the transcription factor and that transcription factor then will guide the rna polymerase to the appropriate template strand and then and then that always then has to read three prime to five prime so it's it's probably a co more complicated than the tata is the one thing. And also you'll notice that the TATA is going to have a complement in the other strand. And so how, do, how does it know which, which strand to start on? How does it know which is the sense strand? And that probably is from more bases here involved than just the Tata box. But if you recognize the Tata box as being a signal to which the transcription factors bind in purple and then to which the RNA polymerase binds to start transcription, that's all I'll ask for here. Yes? So, so the question here is, why is it that there's a distance between where the transcription factors bind and where the start initiation site is? I think it's just the bulk of this protein and the RNA polymerase. These are big molecules. And so I think they're you really have to, to take up a considerable length of the DNA strand just to fit all these molecules on here. And then this, this will, in fact, then start about 30 to 35 bases downstream. So that length of bases doesn't mean anything. So this whole length of bases between the, the length of bases between the promoter and the start sequence, start start synthesizing, see, start synthesizing point, those just aren't transcribed. You just don't use them. And so they're, they're, you have to put something in there, so they're filler. And so you put filler in to take up the space so that someplace downstream here will start doing the proper uh, synthesis of the RNA strand. Yes?
So the question here is the role of the RNA polymerase in forming the phosphodiester bonds as well as the hydrogen bonds. And, and you spotted something here. You're right. There, we're going to put, all of these are going to be base paired. So they're going to be held together by hydrogen bonds. And so then that, that initiates question. Why don't these things just stick there? And the answer is that as part of the RNA polymerase, there's a part of this molecule that's said it's called a paddle. And as it marches along here, putting in the appropriate bases, just behind where it's putting in the bases, it has like a thumb or a paddle that separates these. So now the RNA goes off in a different space and it breaks that hydrogen bonding. Because you're absolutely right. If we had these hydrogen bonds in here, they would stick together. But we avoid that by having the paddle separate them. But again, that's a detail of, of how these molecules work. These are exquisite molecules. And if you go online, you can find really great animations of how they work. Anything else? So, okay, so let's, let's, the question is about a lagging strand. When we talk about leading and lagging strands, we're talking about DNA. We don't use that terminology normally for RNA. But you're right in the sense that when we make, when we use the RNA polymerase to read the DNA strand, we read three prime to five prime and we generate one five prime to three prime. So there really isn't the Okazaki fragment problem that we saw in DNA polymerase because we're always reading three to five. Theoretically, and there's only one case of this that I know of, where you could have the complement for the DNA running five prime to three prime. Right, running five prime, to, wait a minute, what am I doing? Three prime to five prime, this is three five. This would be, right, this would be the three prime here, the five prime here of DNA. You'd have the complement. So you could find a tata -ta box in this strand. It could be the complement of this other strand. You could walk along, find the tata -ta box, put in the RNA polymerase, and read it in that direction. You could do that. There's only one case I know of where the two strands of the DNA read different, generate different proteins, you know, the different genes. The what? It, it just, this is just the complementary strand. And we always generate it five prime to three prime. Okay? Anything else? Okay. Ooh. Um. Now, remember that the DNA is confined to the nucleus. So all this business of transcription factors and the business of promoters, all of that, and the generation of the new RNA transcript, all of that all of that occurs in the nucleus. So let me take this panel and emphasize the point that RNA transcription from DNA occurs in the nucleus. One of the initial ideas that you'll see from what we had up above is that the RNA transcript is complementary. To the DNA strand, from which it was synthesized.
So we're going to generate an RNA transcript just as we showed above. And that's true, and that's going to happen in the nucleus. And if we were a prokaryotic organism, although it wouldn't be in the nucleus, if we were a prokaryotic organism, that would be the end of it. We wouldn't change that RNA at all. But what eukaryotes do is in eukaryotes, there are nuclear enzymes. that cut and splice the RNA transcript, which we're going to call pre-mRNA. Basically, I'm going to simplify this a whole lot, but I'm going to take this box and label this as the so-called pre-mRNA. And as we said here, for every base in this pre-mRNA, there is a complementary base in the DNA from which it was transcribed. But what will happen is that there are enzymes that will find a sequence of bases in this RNA transcript. And they'll basically make a cut here. So enzymes will cut the RNA. And then there'll be another sequence of bases down here, where again, the enzyme will make a cut. So if we label this region 1, and we label this region 2, what will happen is that these enzymes, the very same enzymes that make the cut, also splice the RNA back together again. So that the Enzyme will cut here, but we'll take this number one segment and tie it in to the number two segment. And then again, it will find at the end of the number two segment a region to cut. And there'll be a segment down here, it will cut. So then this will be cut out, and the number three segment then will be ligated or tied back into number two. So basically what's happening is these, en these enzymes are marching along the pre-mRNA, finding consensus sequence, sequences of base and say, cut here. Find another one, cut here. But then take the two regions that weren't cut out and splice them back together. These regions one and two are said to be exons. This means these are expressed regions. And these regions that are cut out are introns meaning intervening sequences. Tomorrow we'll talk a little bit about why this gives an advantage to eukaryotes, because I think you begin seeing if you can have a little bit of jitter in where you make these cuts, you can make different kinds of mRNA from the same gene. And we'll talk about that tomorrow.